Hi, I'm Jonathan Gardner. We're covering section 422 of Griffith's Introduction to Electrodynamics, second edition. Um, I'm going to move fast. You can always rewind. The, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then you can share or like this video. And don't forget to put your comments in a response video or in the comments below. So let's get started. So 422 is where Griffiths explains to you that this surface bound charge and the, the volume bound charge, or the bound surface charge, bound volume charge, are not just constructs of your imagination. Um, you might be tempted to think that we did that funky trick with the integral and like, oh look, this thing falls out and it happens to be a good crutch, but it's really more than that. So where does the surface bound charge come from? And the answer is, if you take a bunch of tiny little dipoles and line them up like that. Okay, so that's a bunch of tiny little dipoles. So let's draw all the negative charges in blue. Negative, 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 negative. And let's draw all the positive charges in red. So we have a positive, 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 positive. And you'll note that inside this area, there is zero net charge. But looky, looky here. At the beginning of this chain and at the end of this chain, there's this charge that accumulates. That's the surface bound charge. Okay. And he extrapolates that and talks about, you know, if you have like a polarized tube, right? So let's draw a tube. And it's all polarized, polarized in this direction, big P. And what happens if you take a look at any cross section of this? So let's just slice and dice. So let's take one cross section like this. Just pull that out. Let's take another cross section that's kind of cut at an angle. Let's pull that out. Okay, what happens? Well, this behaves just like... I thought I grabbed a different color. Oh well. This behaves just like this thing right here, except for in three dimensions, so you get a net negative charge here and a net positive charge there, as you'd expect. The interesting thing here is your polarization vector is pointing this way, bloop, and your normal vector is pointing this way, okay? And so each little slice gets a little less charge than it would have been if it were flat, okay? And you can calculate using um, whatever trigonometric or geometric method you like to use that indeed the dot product is the correct thing to do there to get the right answer. Um, Um, so he, he uh, you can calculate using math if you want to. I don't want to calculate. I think this picture is enough to really understand what's happening. What about the, um, the non-divergent polarization that gives you a bound volume charge? What does that look like? Well, what does it look like when you have divergence? Well, you take some volume and things are either going into or out of. So we're going to pretend that all of our little tiny dipole moments are all pointing or the polarization is all pointing out. Well, what does that look like? Let's use blue and red again. That means we have a positive charge here. And we have a negative charge on the inside. Negative, 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 negative. Okay, what does that look like? Well, um, just like the argument here where these things chain up together, you get a net positive, net negative, whatever the surface is. Here you have, because it's divergent, you have the net negative charge accumulating right there. You know, hence the negative charge is the negative of the divergence of the polarization. Fairly straightforward. Uh, there's this problem, example three. So another nice way of analyzing the uniformly polarized sphere in example two um, where we didn't have a bound surface charge or a volume charge but a bound surface charge is to imagine that you actually have two spheres. One sphere is negative and the other sphere is positive. And when you subject that to an electric field or rather the polarization occurs when you have a dipole moment. So you basically have your, uh, let's use red and blue again. So you have your, your positive sphere and normally if there's no polarization they're sitting right on top of each other. But because there's a slight vertical polarization you get this. And so the end result is you have like a, a negative charge down here and you have a 
positive charge up there, equal and opposite. Okay, in problem 218, you, so let's go with problem 218. I'm not gonna solve that for you. I want you guys to solve as many as you can. Um, you, you figured out that the electric field um, in, the, in the region of the overlap between the two, okay, where it's overlapping, you get an electric field that looks like this. Minus one over four pi epsilon naught Q S vector where S is the displacement between the two, or rather this way, S vector, divided by R cubed, okay? Q is the total charge of this positive sphere. S is the vector from the negative center to the positive center. And now we can rewrite this in polarization where P is QS, and we have, um, P vector is QS over R, well, P is also equal to the dipole moment, as we found out earlier, is equal to the volume of that sphere times the polarization, okay? And so we can rewrite all of this as, this is over R cubed, so things cancel, 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 and we get, I did, I went way overboard, didn't I? Oh, no, I didn't. I got it right. 1 over 3 epsilon naught times the polarization. Okay? Some constant polarization. So that's electric field on the inside. That's between these two bits of stuff. Right? On the points outside, the it, it looks like it's accumulating surface charge at the top and the bottom. And we can, you know, for every bit of the negative sphere, we can combine that with a bit of the positive sphere. And that produces a dipole moment that you can add together. And you end up with the electric field on the outside being, or the potential, being 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the total dipole moment dot the r hat over r squared. Okay. So remember that, that when you do this stuff, that the actual displacements are tiny. They're like almost immeasurable. You can't pull out a, a ruler and measure that. It's just, they're way beyond the idea of tiny. But um, nevertheless, because of the way dipoles behave, it produces electric field that you can definitely feel, okay? So anyway, this is uh, example three. Um, I hope you'd enjoy this. Um, take care.